needing addressed. And now he's going to turn to several areas uh, that manifest this inner heart issue. And this chapter is going to address sexual immorality and the prideful ignorance of the church uh, that really permit this known sin to continue. And then he's going to talk about lawsuits with the brethren, and he's going to talk about what marriage is supposed to look like. He's going to address other aspects, but this is the first one he jumps into. So I want to read the whole chapter. We've read 13 verses. Uh, we've read six verses, rather, in Psalm 13, but 13 verses isn't that long. Let's read the whole chapter together. Uh, so we can see how Paul handles this, and then we're going to split this into a two-part series. So if you don't like what I say today, you can skip next week, right? Uh, verse 1 of chapter 5. <laughs> Bob likes that idea. Uh, <laughs> it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. For I indeed is absent in body, but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together among, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly, you are truly uh, unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet, I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you'd need to go out of the world. But now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reveler, and a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? For those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves this evil person. Paul doesn't really uh, mince words there a whole lot. Uh, he kind of really gets to the, the point of the matter. Let's, let's jump in. Uh, first of all, you see the problem of sin, right? <clears throat> There's an issue in the church. And uh, the sin really seems pretty obvious. Uh, we're not talking about something where uh, you need to encourage someone to step up and serve in the church. They're really kind of just languishing in that. Uh, we're not talking about a probing question where, you know, I might come up to one of you or, or you, you have a friend who comes up and asks, well, was that the most biblical response you could have had in that situation? That's a really great question to ask. And that's a really great, great place for us to start and say, okay, do I need to grow in this area? Is there something I need to change here? It's not even the sin of ignorance where the person really has no idea that what they're doing is wrong, right? Uh, there, there's not uh, an ignorance that I, I had no idea that I wasn't supposed to do this. Uh, that's, that's not what's going on at all. This is actually very obviously blatant to everyone, Paul's not even there and he's getting reports about it. I mean, can you imagine that, that you're not even in the city and you know about this guy's sin? Like, you're not even in the country and you know about this guy's sin in Corinth. Furthermore, his, his opening sentence here really should cut deep. Uh, let's read it again. It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and such immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. 
It's, it's something that's not even tolerated among the Gentiles around you. And we're really, the, the kind of city we're talking about, if you need a modern day equivalence, okay, we're talking about something that, that we would equate to like New Orleans, uh, San Francisco, Las Vegas, those kinds of places where, okay, there's, there's quite a bit of, of bandwidth here of, yeah, there's a lot of depravity. There's a lot of sin that takes place in this city. And the Gentiles in your city don't even tolerate this going on. Not that it doesn't happen, but it's not even tolerated by pagans. The townspeople weren't a bunch of moral people that we could draw a good comparison to. Like, hey, listen, at least your neighbors are doing better than you are. No, like, they're horrible people, and you're still falling short of that, Mark. They don't even tolerate this behavior, and you're allowing it to take place in your church. So he continues in verse 2 that you're puffed up. And have not rather mourned. And, and really what this talks to is that there's not just the sin of this individual, right? It's not just this person needs to repent. The whole church has sinned in not addressing this. They're arrogant in their spirituality, which we've already seen Paul address multiple ways. But they've done nothing about this sin in the church. And that's where the responsibility lies. As, as a congregation of believers, we take it upon ourselves. It's part of our church covenant that I'm covenanting with you and, and we're going to hold each other accountable. And so when you, you're wandering over here, I'm going to step up and love you enough to actually point that out in your life. Now, what does Paul how, how does Paul deal with this? Uh, how do we work through a discipline of sin? Well, before we continue in our beatdown of the, the Corinthians for their willful ignorance, uh, let's just address that there's, there's probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of churches in our country and elsewhere uh, who would rather live in comfort and convenience uh, of a weekly church gathering and have the same thing happen week in and week out than the caring confronting of sin in another believer's life. Uh, that's what's hard, is because when we really start jumping into what Paul's asking them to do, it's messy. It's not, it's not going to be fun. This is somebody they're probably seeing on a regular basis in the city around them. We've talked through this topic much, and so I, I hope that uh, this is what you're seeking uh, to, to have in your life. But our church is not just getting together on Sundays, right? You and I aren't just getting together Sunday mornings and uh, having, having a, a little gathering, and then we don't see each other for the rest of the week. And so hopefully as we're thinking through that, you're saying, okay, how... Am I getting together with other church uh, people? How am I encouraging and edifying other believers throughout the week? How am I serving them? Uh, we're supposed to be living our lives together, right? We, we eat meals together. We study the Bible together. We wrestle with topics of theology and doctrine together. That's literally what basically the four meetings that we have in a week do. So you come to church on Sunday morning, and we gather and we talk about the Bible then Sunday night, we talk about practicing the Bible. Then Tuesday morning, we talk about all sorts of things. Doctrine, theology, questions about the Bible. Then Thursday nights, Jonathan goes deep on the deep end. And if you're like, well, listen, you guys haven't been deep enough yet. He'll take you down into the theology rabbit holes and we'll really dive there, okay? So we work through these things and we wrestle with what does the Bible say? How does it apply in my life? How am I living this out? It's more than just worshiping on Sundays. It, it really extends throughout the week as we rejoice and sorrow together, as we serve each other and encourage each other to love and good works. And what that results in is you and I living lives that are open books to each other. And that's where it gets hard, right? You and I live 
open book lives to each other and invite each other in to struggle through our Christian life together. That's what this person's doing. They're living in sin, and they need someone else to step in and help. Because we live in a broken, sinful world, what does Paul tell them that they need to do? He says in verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, uh, along with my spirit, because I'm not there, but I'm judging with you as if I were, and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that a spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That sounds a little bit harsh, right? Like, delivering him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh? This isn't Job. Why, why are we doing this? Because we live in a broken, sinful world, not all of our interactions are supposed to be joyful and happy. And I, I, I know that's probably shocking to you, but suffering and sin abound around us in our world. And, and we need to gladly admit that to each other. Listen, I need help here. I struggle with this. And I need your help. Even as we, we pray, right, for Phil Spencer, for, for Janet LaFour, for Bernadine's friend Ruby, as we think about those kinds of situations, there's suffering going around. Just a little bit. And, and as we work through that, part of the body of Christ coming together is that we gladly admit and we walk with each other through that. And so when the church gathers, they're to hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But by doing so, somehow this paradoxically saves his spirit. And and we see this in James 5, 19 and 20. Uh, It says very similar. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ. And and what's interesting is that discipline often takes place at this personal level. And and many times it stays at the personal level. Uh, We don't often need it to come to a corporate level where the congregation all gets brought in on the case. However, public sin requires that it be addressed publicly. Because one of the first objections someone could throw in is say, well, why why doesn't the church follow Matthew 18? Why didn't they go through? The whole church knew what was going on. Paul's addressing the whole church. And if somebody was like, I had no idea this was going on. As soon as the letter was read, they knew what was going on, okay? And this is a public sin that's going on in the church, and so it immediately is publicly addressed. The congregations to hear the matter, get involved at a congregational level, and hear Paul's instructing the congregation, not the pastors. We need to remind ourselves of that. The congregation is the one that's holding the authority here, as a body of believers, to remove this evil person from among you. Now, that, uh, as we've gotten to this point, it really sounds kind of radical. But then Paul continues in verses 6 through 8, and that's as far as we're going to get the, this morning, and then we'll recap and finish out the chapter next week. He says in verse 6, Your glory's not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul ties this back to the gospel here and these last couple verses and explains what this exclusion, because of the sin that's taken place, this exclusion that takes place here, what is its purpose, right? 
He points out, first of all, you're glorying, thinking you're doing fine. You're gloating here, and, and you're, not, you're not actually seeing what was going on in your church. And then he reminds them of the gospel in verse 7. This says, listen, he equates leaven or yeast to sin, and, and this would have made sense in their uh, understanding because he, he's equating this with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so in that, you're taking and, and making a loaf of bread that, that has no yeast in it. We're not taking a starter from another batch and starting to make new bread. And for some of you guys, if you've never made bread, especially if you've never made sourdough bread, this kind of gets lost because we just go to the store and buy whatever kind of bread we want, right? We don't make bread anymore. We don't have time for that. But if, if you have made bread at some point in your life, you understand how this, how this works in. And he reminds him, listen, we're purging out this sin, but he reminds him that you're, you are already truly unleavened. Christ has already paid for your sin here. Uh, there, there's not a need to somehow once again sacrifice for sin, right? There, there's not somehow we need to come back and get saved again and, and start over. Christ has already been sacrificed for us. So <clears throat> what does this exclusion look like? Well, first of all, the exclusion is from the fellowship of believers. Uh, in our culture today, exclusion really has come to be equal with hate, right? Uh, if you don't allow someone to be an employee at your business, we literally have laws against that, right? Uh, you're labeled as, as a racist or a homophobic or a number of other words that we can slander your business with. In the church, we invite people to come. We want them to hear about our God. We want to hear about the gospel and how it can change their lives and witness the change that's been brought about in our lives. And so it can kind of seem strange that Christians would be a people that discipline. Well, why are you kicking people out, right? Why would you exclude another person, especially when they're claiming to be a Christian? Why in the world would you do that? In recent years in this church, there's actually been two splits. Uh, one was over joining the Southern Baptist Convention, and the other over what seemed to some to be a sin and a discipline issue. Uh, what really hurts about sin is that as Christians, we sometimes get a mentality that I trudge around in the messy sin of the unsaved world around me all week, and I just want to come to church and get clean. I just want to walk around other people that aren't all messy and sinful and just have a couple minutes to breathe before I jump back into the world. And the problem with that is you and I still sin after salvation. That, that's kind of left out of that equation. Uh, in fact, what makes this harder is that we profess to be Christians. And so we can, we can have a reasonable excuse and rationalize, yeah, that person's not saved. They don't know any better. They don't have Christ in their life. But Virgil's a professing believer, right? But Ken's a professing believer. But Bob's a professing believer. I, I don't understand. You're supposed to know better. Right? She's supposed to live better. And I, I think where we really get so messed up on this is that church sin is just as messy and stinky as the world sin, it's not actually a whole lot different. And sometimes it hurts worse because we weren't expecting it from another believer. Unrepentant sin then impacts the fellowship of the church. Uh, believers uh, that are, are having 
uh, fellowship with other believers, that's impacted, right? Uh, it's, it's going to restrict your hospitality, your interactions throughout the week. It's going to restrict your responsibilities in the church. It's going to exclude you from the communion table. That's what he's referring to here in verse 8. Let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, right? Like, we're not angry at this person. We're not mad that they brought their messy sin into the church. That's not what we're about. He references <clears throat> removing this leaven from the batch of dough. And then let's keep the feast. Let's observe communion. Let's, let's come back together now that we've addressed sin in the body. And let's observe communion again. Uh, we talk about this whenever we observe communion, that we need to be examining each other. We need to be evaluating, okay, my relationships with everyone else in church. Is there anything there that I need to confess, that I need to ask forgiveness for? Have I wronged a brother or sister that I need to fix that? That needs to take place. And, and we shouldn't be observing communion without that being rectified on a regular basis. So, so church, the, the Christ sacrifices cleansed us from all sin, but just as we've said before, while you don't stand guilty before God uh, for that sin in Christ, you still need to confess it. You have to ask for forgiveness and flee that pattern of sinful behavior in your life. So we have a... <clears throat> impact on the fellowship of believers but then you also there's an exclusion from the protection of the local church and, and this is part that that maybe we don't quite uh, understand it in some circles uh, we have the luxury of multiple churches in a given city in america uh, that's very much of a luxury and so as a result it means if you don't like something that I say or somebody didn't say hi to you or you don't like the songs that we sing here or the color of the carpet or the fact that we have black coffee on Sunday mornings um, and you wanted espresso, whatever. If you don't like it, you can drive to another church. And you don't really have to drive 30 minutes down the road. You can actually drive three or four minutes. Five minutes, five miles. It, it doesn't actually take that long of a drive. And just like we see in the Corinthians, <clears throat> we struggle with many of the same theological errors today that Paul fought when he was alive just a couple thousand years ago. Uh, the local church provides protection for believers from false teaching. It provides a level of protection even from demonic activity in your life. You're like, hold up, Pastor. Paul says that the church is supposed to hand the person over to Satan. That implies that they were under some level of protection while they were attending that church, right? The church is handing them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Uh, the church also provides protection from something we all struggle with, self-deception, uh, which leads to the kind of arrogance we've seen in this chapter. Uh, when the church lives life with each other each week, you're not fooling anyone. And, and so, yes, you can run to another church where they don't know you, or you can stay in a church where they lovingly care and know you and address the sin in your life. I was talking uh, to my coworker. My coworker is a Mennonite, and uh, they live just out near uh, Mechanicsburg. And it was interesting. We got talking about church discipline, and um, church discipline is actually handled very strongly in their community. First of all, they have aspects in their community that we don't have in ours that we're striving to have in our kind of community, uh, which is you can come over to my house anytime. You can borrow any of my tools, and you're welcome at any meal, okay? Like, that is just, it's an open-door policy. He's like, it is not uncommon for us to have a dozen people at our house after church on Sunday. Like, we just, we have a meal, and that's cool, and we're hanging out, and then we do our, our evening Bible study groups, and, and it's very common for people to just always be coming in and out of our house. 
He said, so as a result, there's two things that church discipline impacts. He said, one, you're no longer welcome in my house. He said, that is huge. That you're, you're no longer extending me hospitality. I, I'm no longer welcome in all these people that are my friends, that are my brothers, that I live week in and week out with. I'm no longer welcome at your house. Right? He, he says that, and we'll, we'll address this a little bit, but he says it in, at the end of verse 11, to not even eat with the person, right? It's not, hey, listen, we, I know we church disciplined you, but let's go grab Chipotle afterwards, okay? We'll talk about the Super Bowl. No, that, that's not what we're doing. I'm not going to treat you as though your sin doesn't matter, that everything can just be okay during the week. Your sin is serious, and so much so, you don't see it. And so my interactions with you are always going to be to help you see your sin, to lead to repentance, to lead to reconciliation. The first thing that church discipline impacts is their hospitality. He said, secondly, he said, I've been an elder in my church. He said, and I've called up someone and said, we're observing communion this Sunday, and you are not welcome. He said, that's devastating. Because all of a sudden, publicly, the church sees that I'm not allowed to observe communion with him. Why? Because I'm not willing to address sin in my life. We don't have that kind of severity in our community, right? It, and, and he actually shared with me one of the men that they were confronting a, a sin issue, and he didn't like it. They even told him, we're no longer cashing any of your tithe checks to the church. We're no longer accepting your money. And he said, we got to the place where we actually called him up and said, this Sunday, we're doing public congregational church discipline with you. We're bringing it to the congregation. We're at that level because you're not listening to the elders. And he said, and the man went to another church because, well, they'll take me in. Why? Because they don't know me. They don't know my sin. They're just happy to have another body come in the door, right? We want to care about one another, and as much as it's hurtful, as much as it's messy, as much pain as it might cause, we are not going to fool anyone in our church because we know each other. We know when we're doing great and when we're struggling. You can't hide your sin in the closet, right? Your selfishness comes out. Your lust comes out. Your anger comes out. Your smoking comes out. Your life is an open book, right? The, the church knows what's going on in your life. Your marriage is an open book. Your parenting is an open book. Hey, listen, you see something that I need to grow in? Here it is, right? That, that's what's going on. And as a result, the church is able to work as agents of grace in your life for God's glory. That's, that's what the purpose of this is for. It leads to your sanctification. It leads to God's glory. It leads to you continuing in growth in Christ Jesus. So what are some of the takeaways here? And we'll pick this up next week. <clears throat> First of all, uh, the biblical model of church in the New Testament includes discipline, right? And so if we're going to look at a church that doesn't have discipline, that doesn't practice discipline, we're looking at an unbiblical model of the church. Uh, secondly, uh, church discipline plays a vital role in the gospel change that God desires to do in each one of his children. Uh, because we're still uh, sinners and, and we can be blind or even willful in that behavior, God graciously desires to confront that sin through the believers around you, sounding an alarm. Just as parents are not seen as hateful for, for, you know, chastening their children, disciplining their children, we're reminded in Hebrews that God disciplines us. He chastens us as a loving father. 
Discipline comes out of a heart of love and care, grace and mercy towards that person. Because we recognize, I, I sin too. So I, I want to call out the sin in your life, and you are welcome to call out the sin in my life. Uh, the goal is not to show how you're better than the person being disciplined. It's actually to cause you to evaluate your life and say, where do I need to confess sin to? Uh, the goal is always repentance and reconciliation. It's not slander. It's not excommunication. It's not damning someone to hell. No, that's, that's not what we're trying to do at all. The, the motivation comes from a care for the brethren and, and a care for the testimony of Christ and his church, that it would remain pure, that he would be glorified in the community. Uh, imagine being part of Corinth and knowing, hey, that church has a sin that I don't even let happen, right? Like, how, how would you think about that? As an unbeliever, just for five seconds, just think about that. Like, I know something's going on at that church that we would never dream of doing. That's, that's what we're talking about. And, and so as, as we evaluate our own lives and as we think about how is this practice in our context, we don't have to wait for a massive issue to come up like this. As we live week in and week out, it's taken care of at a much smaller level. And we can address those areas of selfishness, arrogance, anger, those kinds of things on a weekly basis. Father, we need your help to do this because not only do we selfishly like pointing out sins in other people, but hiding our own. We also are self-deceived and desperately need other brethren and your Holy Spirit to show us where we are hiding from ourselves. The reality of our sin, we are willfully ignorant. Uh, we ignore it because we don't want to deal with it, and so we pray that as we strive uh, to follow the biblical model for what a church is supposed to look like, that you would help us to be willing to open up our doors of our lives to each other, that we would welcome the other believers in this congregation to know us and to know us well, that they might point out the sin and the areas that we're struggling with, and to walk with us through that. Because they love us, because they care for us, and because they're being obedient to Scripture. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with uh, page 707 in your hymn book. It has been a hymn book day. So